Welcome to today's GISA presentation, Stone Wallet 50, a historical look at the continuing journey for LGBTQ farming under the law. More about today's session in a moment. The next course after today will be on August 9 on overdose awareness. The details and flyers for this program are forthcoming. As with all GISA classes, that session will be open to all judiciary employees and will be broadcast statewide. Today's class will end at 1.20 p.m. Attorneys attending will receive a CLE certificate of attendance or 1.5 CLE ethics professionalism credits when you sign up. Non-attorney attendees can print a course completion certificate from JLS. Now to today's program again entitled Stonewall at 50, a historical look at the continuing journey for LGBTQ equality under the law. Today's featured speakers are um, there to hear, Ariel Adler, Ezra Young, our moderator, Lisa Burke, and Bill Singer. Ariel Adler is an associate at Homer's in Sandler, where she focuses on corporate bankruptcy and creditors' rights matters, including bankruptcy related litigation. She is a graduate of the University of Southern California and Boston College Law School. She is chairman of the LGBT rights section of the New Jersey State Bar Association and an active member of the National LGBT Bar Association. A little out of sequence here, Bill Singer is a partner at Singer and Bevan and is of counsel to Diana Adams Law and Mediation. He is a graduate of Rutgers College and Columbia University School of Law. He has served as general counsel of the National LGBT Bar Association since its founding in the 1980s and has served as general counsel to the ACLU and the George and Helen Siegel Foundation, the New Jersey Sierra Club, and the New Jersey Association for Justice. Among his many awards, Mr. Singer was the inaugural winner of the Women Practitioner Award from the National LGBT Bar Association, the Bill of Rights Award from the New Jersey ACLU, the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award from the Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Section of the New Jersey State Bar Association, and the Presidential Award from the New Jersey Association for Justice. As we're young, as a private practitioner who handles transgender civil rights cases, with a focus on employment protections and healthcare discrimination matters before federal courts and agencies. Mr. Young is a graduate of Cornell University and Columbia Law School. He previously worked at the Transgender Legal Defense and Educational Fund, the Columbia Law School Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, and the African American Policy Forum. He's past co chair and founding board member of the National Trans Law Association. Our moderator is Lisa Burke, who is program coordinator in the Central Office Minority Consent Unit. Which we have names so Prior to that, she served in the Bailey Maiden in Hudson Business. Before joining the judiciary, Lisa worked in higher education administration. She is a graduate of New Jersey State University and Columbia University. She has extensive <laughs> academic background in diversity issues and related training. Some of her areas of expertise and professional expertise are inter and interest, including gender, include, sorry, gender, race, culture, sexuality, age, religion, ability, and human rights, and the intersections of these sometimes seemingly conflicting aspects of identity and experience. And with that, well, I thought it was going to be a short, single, and long introduction. <laughs> I'm going to turn Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for those introductions, Steve. Uh, to start, I want to express the appreciation of the panel to Judge Grant, Steve Bonville, and Melanie Payne for the opportunity to share today's presentation in the context of GISA uh, to ITO for their technical support. Without them, we couldn't do most of this. And of course, to all of you here today attending in person as well as in the vicinages, and a welcome to our colleagues from the Attorney General's Office and Office of the Public Defender. Um, we hope that you will find today's program informative and engaging, and that you will leave with at least one thing that you did not know when you came into the room, but hopefully more than one. And now to the topic at hand. Um, we are presenting today's program in four parts. For a common departure, I'm going to share a brief overview of Stonewall, what is this about which we speak, and the significance of Stonewall at 50, with a disclaimer that as thorough and succinct as I try to be, um, I will not be doing justice to this moment in time because we are limited by time and there's so much that can be told. So I've selected a few things that I think are helpful for us to have a common understanding for the conversation. Ariel's then going to paint the constitutional backdrop in terms of LGBTQ equality under the law. Ezra's going to discuss LGBTQ rights from a federal view. 
uh, including insights into the role, challenges, and value of impact litigation, and considering specifically trans equality and trans access to justice issues. Bill is going to take us through an exploration of the reality of these promises and principles, particularly in the context of relationship recognition and family formation, or stated another way in the work of family creation and family protection. And then at the conclusion, we hope to have at least a few minutes in which we can engage in conversation amongst the panel and with all of you and answer questions that you may have. So why are we framing today's program around Stonewall at 50? What does a movement for social change have to do with access to justice through the courts? We hope we can answer those questions to some satisfying degree. But to begin to answer those questions, we need to take a step back in time to take ourselves back to the summer of 69. So whether the step back is within the realm of one's own life experience or a true historical look back, I ask you to accompany, accompany me for a few minutes as I try to succinctly paint a brief picture of what life was like then generally and specifically for LGBTQ people. So, for the history of the moment, 1969, Richard Nixon had become President of the United States. Richard J. Hughes was Governor of New Jersey. The average yearly income was $8,550, monthly rent $135. The cost of a Toyota Corona, and I will note when I gave this presentation on Middlesex, somebody said, oh, you misspoke, you meant a Corolla. No, some may actually remember there was a Toyota Corona, Brand new, $1,950. Walmart had incorporated, and a gallon of gas cost 35 cents. On the social cultural side, Sesame Street had just debuted. The Beatles gave their last public performance. Bell bottom jeans and tie dye were the teen fashion of the moment. The Rolling Stones, James Brown, Bob Dylan, Marvin Gaye, and Elton John were among the top popular musicians. And then in the serious realm. The death penalty had just been abolished in the United Kingdom. The trial of the Chicago Seven, who were accused of inciting riots at the 1968 Democratic National Convention, was underway. Black students at Cornell had used force to overtake a hall demanding a black studies program. Police forces across the country were cracking down on student protests. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 had only been passed five years earlier and the nation was still grieving the assassinations of President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Bobby Kennedy, just to name a few. As of 50 years ago, this moment, where we are, the crew of Apollo 11 had not yet walked on the moon, nor had Woodstock yet happened. And when I gave this presentation in Middlesex, it was on June 28th, but at that moment at noon, Stonewall hadn't happened yet either. And uh, for those who've been in my cultural competency, trainings in the past, I'm going to use a few terms that you wouldn't normally hear me use. So, homosexuality, a term that had been coined in 1869, at this point in 1969, was still considered a sexually deviant psychopathology by the American Psycho Psychological Association, and in 49 of the 50 states, consenting sex between adults of the same sex was a crime. At the local level, alcohol beverage control laws and regulations were routinely invoked to criminalize the presence of LGBTQ people in public accommodations such as bars, taverns, and clubs. One of the resources in today's packet is a law journal article by uh, the State Bar Cast President Tom Prohl that discusses that particular dynamic in the context of New Jersey's own Asbury Park. It makes for very eye-opening reading, to say the least. And it's a part of the story of what was also happening in places like the Stonewall Inn. So life in 1969, while really not that long ago, was different in so many ways. So with that social moment backdrop, would you join me for a virtual walk over to Greenwich Village to take a look at the Stonewall Inn? And the picture on the right depicts the Stonewall Inn, much as it looked at that point in time. A seemingly incidental, innocuous, almost overlookable establishment, the Stonewall Inn decades later under President Obama would become a site in the National Historic Register 
because of its place as a site of resistance, a tangible milestone that moves the advancement of LGBTQ civil rights from local spaces to the national level. As the National Park Service registry notes, before the 1960s, almost everything about living openly as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer person was illegal. New York City laws against homosexual activities were particularly harsh. The Stonewall Uprising on June 28, 1969 is a milestone in the quest for LGBTQ civil rights and provided momentum for a movement. The night of June 28, 1969 started out seemingly like most other nights. It's a hot summer evening, people hung out, people were walking the streets, and the usual patrons of the Stonewall were gathered there to spend an evening amongst its community. But as USA Today reported in its June 27, 2019 article, Greenwich Village spontaneously decided they had absorbed enough enough abuse from the police and announced both loud and proud that they were not going to take any more. That night, fueled by collective <coughs> grief over the death of icon Judy Garland, the oppressive summer heat, and the endless persecution by police forces and others, there was a collective will to stand in resistance. That night when the police came to raid the Stonewall, people said enough. The patrons of the Stonewall resisted and, in fact, fought back. And there are, in the study of history, we know uh, multiple narratives about what happens, right? There's all from the vantage point of the person who's sharing the eyewitness story. I want to pay tribute to that to say this version that I'm telling is the collective version, and some still may say that it's a particular collective version. Many versions, though, of the widely accepted historical narrative Note that it was trans women of color, including people like Sylvia Rivera and New Jersey's own Marsha P. Johnson, who were at the forefront of the physical resistance to the police action. And whether it is historical fact or historical legend, Johnson is believed, quote, to have thrown the first brick. The incident that night sparked public acts of witness and resistance locally that grew and expanded over a series of nights. And from that was born an organized national movement, if you will. To say that the resistance spread like wildfire would not, in my view, be an understatement. So if people have observed or heard in the news, especially over the past weeks during the month of June, there, were lot, there was lots of both print press and, and television press coverage about Stonewall and about World Pride. You may have heard varying terms, uh, uprising, resistance, riot, revolution. Um, to make mention about someone throwing a brick at police in this physical setting may seem a little bit odd and out of the ordinary. But in the telling of this history, those details, and the countless details we cannot explore in the limits of time today, all matter. And it's particularly important to note that the New York Police Department Commissioner this year in the days leading up to the 50-year commemoration, publicly, formally apologized and acknowledged that the actions on the part of the New York Police Department as a public serving institution committed to uphold public safety and well-being were on the whole inappropriate and a misuse, in fact an abuse of police power that was influenced by bias. As the history of Stonewall continues to be told, Fair and reasonable people will debate whether or not, was it a revolution? Was it a riot? Was it an uprising? Was it a resistance? As someone whose daily work centers around race and ethnicity and racial and ethnic justice, I can't have that conversation or entertain those questions without also thinking about the racial dimensions of those terms and categorizations. So, how does Stonewall the moment fit into the movement for social justice today? The incidents of Stonewall played a significant and identifiable role in moving the work of advancing LGBTQ equality from localized efforts to a national movement. The movement from the local to the national 
is not without fair critique, as for some, as for some time, quote, the movement, meaning the monolithic, we're all the same movement, was seen over time as increasingly more corporatized and as largely white, largely cisgender, largely heteronormative. For example, as commonly has been noted in the national efforts to gain civil marriage equality, which frequently centered, both in word and image, at the state and federal level, around the lives of lesbians and gays, neighbor, kind of neighbor next door images and stories. So there's always a problem in diverse contexts with suggesting a singular or monolithic entity. But as the movement for equality showed a publicly unified face before courts and legislatures, it has taken decades to realize once again, and I note once again, because if we look at the local level history before Stonewall, there were diverse, inclusive, broadly embracing coalitions such as the Gay Liberation Front to realize once again a coalition that broadly, deeply, and richly is representative of the expansive diversity amongst LGBTQ plus people. So as we move forward in our conversation this afternoon, there are two overarching questions that Ariel, Ezra, and Bill will explore in greater detail. How the synergy built off that moment in time contributes, and still today contributes, to the evolution of civil rights and equality under the law. For those of you who haven't had a chance to avail yourself of viewing the Judiciary's Insights um, installment for June, I did provide the link so you can access that at a later time. And now on that note, with that very brief summary about Stonewall, um, as I noted earlier, life in 1969, while not really that long ago, was very different in so many ways, yet perhaps not as different as we might at first glance suppose. So to consider the question, of what is the reality of equality under the law for LGBTQ plus people today, I'm going to first turn to Ariel to share a constitutional perspective. Good afternoon, everybody. So just over 20 years after Stonewall, um, beginning of the 1990s, the, the landscape of LGBTQ rights had moved forward in some ways, but was still such a far cry from what it is today. Um, there were a handful of states that banned um, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in contexts like employment and housing, um, but of those handful, uh, the majority were limited to um, state employees, for example. Um, Colorado was one of those states, and its uh, larger municipalities, such as Aspen and Boulder, um, had uh, enacted broader protections um, against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, specifically defined as heterosexuality, homosexuality, and bisexuality. Um, opponents of uh, these inclusive non-discrimination laws and protection on the basis of sexual orientation um, mobilized in 1991 in Colorado um, support for the No Protected Status for Sexual Orientation ballot initiative uh, which they were able to put on the ballot for the November 1992 election in Colorado. Um, this ballot initiative, this amendment to the Colorado Constitution, which was designated Amendment 2, would prevent the state from enacting, adopting, or enforcing any law or policy allowing gay, lesbian, or bisexual orientation, conduct, practices, or relationships from being the basis of a claim for minority status or a discrimination claim. So this incredibly broad amendment would have repealed a local and state laws and policies protecting individuals from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but also proactively would have banned any future protections um, from any uh, instrumentality of the state at any level of government and um, any branch of the Colorado state government. Um, amendment 2 passed, uh, much to the surprise of many people who thought at the time that Colorado was a progressive state, um, and almost immediately affected individuals and proponents of uh, LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual, inclusive, non-discrimination policies, um, filed a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of Amendment 2. Um, that lawsuit uh, became the Supreme Court case Romer v. Evans, which reached uh, the Supreme Court of the United States in 1996. 
uh, the Colorado Supreme Court had agreed with the plaintiffs um, and found that Amendment 2 was unconstitutional. Uh, the Supreme Court found that Amendment 2 was unconstitutional because it violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment and affirmed the Colorado Supreme Court's uh, judgment. Um, the court recognized that lesbians, gay men, and bisexuals have the same right to seek protection from the government as any other people. And whereas the proponents of Amendment 2 um, would describe the, their motivation um, in putting forth that amendment as simply depriving a specific group of special rights, in fact, what Amendment 2 did was it imposed a special disability on this group and made it impossible for uh, a particular class of people, uh, lesbian, gays, gays, and bisexuals, from seeking redress from the government. The Supreme Court found that there was no rational relationship to state interests there. Um, the proposed or the, um, the es espoused um, rationale were uh, protecting the freedom of association of, for example, landlords who uh, were opposed to uh, lesbian and gay relationships um, and conserving resources to fight discrimination on other bases. The Supreme Court said that the sheer breadth of the amendment and its effect on lesbian, gay, and bisexual citizens of Colorado were so far removed from the justifications that were given that it was impossible to credit them. And therefore, um, Amendment 2 seemed inexplicable by anything but animus towards the class of people that it disadvantaged. Fast forward to the end of the 1990s. Um, as Lisa mentioned in her um, introduction of Stonewall, um, many states criminalized or had anti-sodomy laws um, on the books. Um, as of 1998, more than two dozen states had anti-sodomy laws, and their, uh, the state's ability to criminalize uh, consensual sexual conduct between adults um, had been upheld in the Supreme Court case Bowers v. Hardwick in 1986. Um, in Houston, Texas, in 1998, police had responded to a reported weapons disturbance in the private apartment of Mr. John Lawrence. And when they arrived, they saw him and Mr. Tyrone Gardner engaged in um, a private consensual sexual act. At the time, Texas had a homosexual conduct law, very transparently named, and the two men were charged with a violation of that law. Uh, the law criminalized certain sexual conduct, but as between same-sex couples only. In fact, that law previously had criminalized the sexual conduct for um, different sex couples as well, but in the 70s it had been amended uh, to what it was in 1998, limited to same-sex couples. Um, the men pleaded no contest in state court, but challenged the constitutionality of the state law. Uh, the state court of appeals upheld the conviction under um, the binding precedent of Bowers v. Hardwick, um, and Texas, uh, Texas's highest Supreme uh, criminal court refused to hear that appeal, um, and the case found its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, the court first determined um, that it had to address whether or not Bowers was still good law at that time. Um, and it, in analyzing that question, came to the conclusion that the assumptions that Bowers had been founded on were questionable at the time of that decision and based on the developing understanding of the relationships of same-sex couples had to be overruled um, in Lawrence v. Texas and in fact was incorrect when decided. The court overruled, or pardon me, the court ruled that the homosexual conduct law was unconstitutional as a violation of due process and reversed the judgment of the Texas criminal court. The court found that liberty under the Due Process Clause included the rights of individuals to make their most intimate and personal choices, which are central to personal dignity and autonomy. Bowers had incorrectly framed that issue as simply whether there was a fundamental right of gay people to engage in sodomy, which incredibly demeaned the claim of liberty that the complainants had brought to the courts at that time, um, which was whether people had a constitutional right to enter into intimate personal relationships. Uh, in fact, the criminalization of this 
intimate sexual conduct was an invitation to discriminate against lesbian, gay, and, and bisexual people, same-sex couples, in both the public and private spheres. And in fact, in a prior case, the state of Texas had admitted that the homosexual conduct law had been a basis to disfavor same-sex couples uh, in areas such as housing and um, in questions of adoption. The, court, the Supreme Court found that the state's uh, proffered interest in pr promoting morality or expressing moral disapproval was not a legitimate government interest that permitted this kind of government intrusion into the personal and private lives of individuals. Fast forwarding again, uh, approximately 10 years after Lawrence v. Texas, um, the landscape for same-sex couples had changed and certain states had begun to recognize that same-sex uh, same -sex couples were entitled to the benefits um, and uh, responsibilities of marriage and had begun, to, uh, had begun to enact laws that confirmed that, that right at the state level. Um, Edie Windsor and Thea Spire had gotten married in my home province of Ontario in 2007 and lived in New York, uh, which was one of the states that recognized their marriage. Uh, when Ms. Spire passed, she left her entire estate to Windsor, who sought to claim an exemption from the estate tax um, as a surviving spouse. Um, but she didn't, she didn't qualify for that exemption based on the uh, Internal Revenue Code's definition of who was or who could be a spouse. Um, under Section 3 of the 1996 Defense of Marriage Act, or DOMA, uh, marriage and spouses were defined specifically as one man and one woman uh, as husband and wife. So specifically defined to exclude same-sex couples. Um, faced with that um, lack of basis for not qualifying, uh, Windsor paid the $363,000 in taxes and sought a refund, which the IRS denied. Um, Windsor sued to challenge the constitutionality of Section 3. Uh, meanwhile, uh, President Barack Obama had instructed the DOJ to enforce but not defend the Defense of Marriage Act, um, and a group from the House of Representatives intervened to defend the constitutionality of Section 3 of DOMA. When the case reached the Supreme Court, uh, the court found that Section 3 was unconstitutional and violated the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses. Um, the court found that DOMA had an avowed purpose and practical effect to impose a disadvantage and a separate status and so a stigma upon all who enter into same-sex marriages made lawful by the unquestioned authority of the states to regulate domestic affairs. By seeking, the very, by seeking to injure the very group that New York sought to protect and dignify with its lawful status, DOMA violated basic due process and equal protection. The Supreme Court cited the evolving understanding of the meaning of equality in the context of marriage um, and found that there was no legitimate purpose that overcame DOMA's purpose and effect to disparage and injure these same-sex couples that New York and states like it had sought to include in its marriage laws and protect their personhood and dignity. Meanwhile, in New Jersey, um, as of 2006, the New Jersey Supreme Court had held that same-sex couples were entitled to all the rights and benefits of marriage, but stopped short of finding that there was a fundamental right to marry, and instead uh, punted to the New Jersey legislature to uh, come up with a solution. Um, and the legislature came back with the civil union statutory structure. In 2012, the legislature, in fact, passed a, passed a bill that would have made same-sex marriage legal in New Jersey, but the governor at the time vetoed. Um, when Windsor was decided in 2013, New Jersey then had civil unions for same-sex couples and not marriage. Um, but in light of Windsor and its, it, its effect on federal uh, entitlement to federal benefits, and um, the 2006 case from the New Jersey Supreme Court, a trial court in Garden State Equality v. Dow held that New Jersey's denial of marriage to same-sex couples violated the New Jersey Constitution. Um, after an initial appeal by the governor was withdrawn um, because the same, 
state Supreme Court declined to grant a stay of the trial court's order pending appeal, same-sex marriage became legal in New Jersey. In 2015, uh, the Supreme Court decided Obergefell v. Hodges, which um, is referred to by many by or as the, um, the the gay marriage case, which really doesn't do justice in in reflecting um, the broad recognition of of liberties and rights that that case uh, had for same-sex couples. Um, <coughs> certain states um, had still defined marriage as between a man and a woman, including Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, and Tennessee, and same-sex couples and surviving spouses of same-sex couples challenged those states' denials of the right to marry and recognition of validly performed out-of-state marriages. Uh, the trial courts of each of those states ruled in favor of the petitioners, uh, but the consol on consolidated appeal to the Sixth Circuit, uh, the appellate court reversed. When the case came to the Supreme Court, the court recognized that same-sex couples are entitled to the fundamental right to marry under the Due Process Clause and Equal Protection Clauses and invalidated those state laws to the extent that they deprive same-sex couples um, of marriage on the same terms and conditions. The court started, or the majority, uh, Justice Kennedy, started the opinion with the statement that the Constitution promises liberty to all within its reach a liberty that includes certain specific rights that allow persons within a lawful realm to define and express their identity. The court recognized right away that in seeking to have their marriages recognized, petitioners didn't want or, de or didn't intend to denigrate marriage as opponents of same-sex marriage uh, had argued, but wanted to live and honor the memories of their spouses uh, joined by that bond. The court recognized that even as between different sex couples, marriage had evolved over the last hundred years, and that the reasons that the court had found marriage fundamental uh, in its prior precedent under the Constitution applied with equal force to same-sex couples. Uh, for example, um, the right to choose who you marry was inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. Um, marriage safeguards children and families, and that applied with no less force to the children of same-sex couples. Um, and marriage was one of the keystones of the American social order. All of those applied uh, equally to same-sex couples. Um, the court rejected the petitioner's arguments that, that same-sex couples were seeking some new right to same-sex marriage, noting that nothing in the precedent said that rights would be defined by those who exercised them in the past. Um, the court also said it probably wouldn't lead to fewer opposite-sex marriages, since people got married for many reasons, um, and that opponents of same-sex marriage could still advocate against it, um, just as much as proponents of same-sex marriage could advocate for it. Um, the court dealt with the question of whether it should wait for the democratic process to play out, noting, importantly, that fundamental rights are not subject to vote, um, that there was a circuit split, and that harm to same-sex couples would continue if the court didn't decide the question. Um, which was rightly a question of constitutional law before the court. And the court found plainly that the Constitution granted to same-sex couples equal dignity in the eyes of the law. Together, these cases recognize that the Constitution prohibits the government from infringing on the liberty of same-sex couples to form intimate relationships, including marriage, and that LGBTQ families are families just the same as anybody else's. Um, and although the court's discussions of dignity and autonomy in these cases apply further and pave the way for affirmation of LGBTQ rights in other contexts, such as uh, uh, education and the second parent adoption, um, it's really important to acknowledge that the holdings themselves don't reach everyone in the LGBT community equally or at all. Um, for example, only Romer mentioned bisexuals explicitly because that's how sexual orientation was defined in the local ordinances that Amendment 2 sought to overturn. Um, gender identity and sexual orientation are completely different characteristics, and transgender people can identify anywhere on the sexual orientation spectrum, including as heterosexual. And there are loving, committed romantic relationships outside of marriage. Um, liberty and equality is not just about our intimate and private decisions, although certainly, uh, 
being able to marry who we love is fundamental. Um, but it's about being able to live and work and make our way through the public sphere as well. And the next questions, um, the case is pending before the Supreme Court now, will really take that next step into uh, how, what the scope of liberty and equality is in the public sphere as opposed to these four cases. Thank you very much, Ariel. That's a perfect segue to move to Ezra to um, take us to the next dimension of this discussion. Thank you so much. Um, so I'd like to start by borrowing a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Jr. Um, the long arc of history born uh, bends towards justice. The reason why I want to start there is um, there's a tendency this year, marking the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, to, in the popular imagination at least, conceive of LGBT rights as something that maybe just started in 1969. Maybe that's an excuse for why we're only where we are right now, right? But that would be much like saying that the black civil rights movement only started in the 50s and 60s. That would be complete and utter nonsense. It built off of hundreds of years of black and allied resistance towards systemic racism, which, of course, is not yet solved, among other things. So why is it important to sort of conceptualize this as being a longer, longer journey, a journey that we're all still on? Well, I, I think in part because many of the problems we see today, especially uh, facing transgender Americans, to back hundreds and hundreds of years. The demands that we see today on the news and magazines, even before the Supreme Court, which is where I'll end today, um, are nothing new, quite literally. So let's just think about the 10 years before Stonewall, right? So Stonewall is in 1969. But we have documented uh, incidents of riots, of sit-ins, of um, resistance movements, of marches, by trans people in particular, by trans people who color in particular, that date back far, far sooner. So events you probably have never heard of before, because they've been lost to most of the dust in the industry. Um, in Los Angeles in 1959, a group of transgender women of color, and some folks who we might call drag queens today, uh, resisted police at uh, Cooper's Donut Riot, which was sort of in the not great part of the city at the time. Police, much like at Stonewall, were harassing these women, trying to kick them out um, of the one place where they could afford to buy food on the cheap, where they could rest, where they could join the community. So what did they do? Well, the police arrested a few people, and these women stood up. They started throwing donuts. They threw coffee. They threw trash at the police until those people could escape. Very little news coverage of it at the time, but that was a major moment of resistance. Uh, flash forward to 1965 in Philadelphia, the Dewey Lunch Counter sit-in. Sit-ins might sound familiar, right? group of mostly black trans women uh, came together after they had been harassed by the Dewey's management, who established a rule basically to kick them out, to not serve them, and they just said no more. Um, after a group of their friends had been arrested, a week later they came back and they staged a formal sit-in for five days. They sat in, right? Re resisted police, and eventually the Dewey's management sat down, met with them, negotiated terms, got rid of the policy that had banned their service, and they continued on. Uh, another one might not have heard of, uh, Compton Cafeteria Riot in San Francisco, 1966, three years before Stonewall. Once again, mostly transgender women of color, though others uh, in the gay community, came together to push back against police harassing people at the cafeteria. Again, it was mostly working women, some sex workers, some just trans women, where this was the only place they could be openly themselves, uh, were denied service. Uh, management called the police on them, in particular some police who were known to be particularly violent and were known to sexually abuse these folks, and they decided no more. They threw their copies at the police. They threw a riot. Um, a bunch of them were arrested, and they continued to riot for several days. Um, so little coverage of that event that all we have are oral histories, and we don't even know what they happened, other than it happened in 1966. Um, it's not that these moments aren't important, it's, and that's not the reason why people don't know about them. Part of the reason why people don't know about them is Transgender lives and LGBT lives more broadly have been so undervalued that newspapers didn't want to report on these things. Um, people didn't want to identify or connect these moments to other civil rights moments at the time, even though they obviously go hand in hand, borrowing from each other, including some of the same people, right? Sometimes our communities overlap when we participate in the same groups. Um, the reason why I bring this up. I do impact litigation. So impact litigation for maybe the handful of non-lawyers in the brand is basically, as a lawyer, you pick a really big fight against an opponent who you know is going to push back like hell, and that's the whole point. 
point because you want to shoot your case up through the courts. You don't necessarily want the case to settle. You want to get a judge in front of the case to issue an opinion so we have precedence um, so that that judge can help broadcast to the rest of the country what we are going to do about this particular social problem. Um, oftentimes people think impact litigation is only things that go to the Supreme Court or only things that you've heard about. Um, but impact litigation is really more about bringing members of a regional community together to sort of come together and decide a social problem, quite honestly. So sometimes it's marriage equality. Uh, for transgender people, it's other things. Uh, in New Jersey, there have been battles um, about whether trans people can receive identity documents that match who they are, uh, how many fiery hoops someone has to go through to get a name change, to get a birth certificate amended. Um, before uh, same-sex marriage was the law of the land, it was whether your marriage remained valid after you transitioned. If after transition you and your partner were of a different legal sex, um, has everything to do with adoption, parentage, um, those sorts of things, right? So these battles are fought all throughout the country and have been fought for many, many decades. Um, so why is it important to understand what impact litigation does and a little bit about this sort of historical racial uh, ratio that I'm talking about? Well, again, as I started with, many days prevailing legal issues for transgender people in particular are issues our country has been dealing with for a very long time. Let's think about uh, military inclusion. That's a really big one, right? The trans ban supposedly erected by Trump. Trump actually didn't erect the trans ban. The trans ban was erected by JFK in the 60s in the midst of putting together the Civil Rights Act of 1964 before basically he was assassinated. That is its origins. Democratic president largely bought it as a great civil rights hero who did something pretty nasty that we're still living with the consequences of today. Of course, trans people have always served and served openly in the US military. We have records of trans people serving in the uh, American Revolution on both sides, um, Civil War, both sides, some of whom uh, were lauded with multiple medals, many of whom were buried with military honors, despite the fact it's publicly known that they're trans. Um, we have uh, trans folks of color who have openly uh, lived their lives, who met with dignitaries in the 1800s and even 1700s. Uh, one in particular who led an amazing life is Liwa of the Zini nation. Uh, she went by uh, female pronouns, but actually identified as a third gender person in the 1800s. She was a famous artisan, so famous that she traveled uh, the nation on work, which was common at the time. He even met with President Cleveland and other dignitaries in D.C. openly in a formal engagement. Okay? Um, now, these demands, this, these demands to live openly, to be part of society, to participate on equal terms, again, nothing new. What's new is the public's broader desire um, and capacity, quite frankly, to embrace these ideas, to think about ways to open up our courts to open up, um, our schools to open up, our institutions to LGBT folks, openly in particular trans folks. Um, what I wanted to do to sort of build off of uh, my colleagues' uh, comments is to talk a little bit about some LGBT cases that are in front of the Supreme Court this year. Okay? Um, so there are three Title VII cases up in front of the Supreme Court this year. Title VII, for those not in the know, is a federal employment non-discrimination law that bans employment discrimination on a bunch of grounds, including sex. The big issue before the Supreme Court is whether LGBT people are protected um, under sex discrimination protections. Now, a lot of people will talk about this as being, oh, this is an issue where if we just pass some new laws, everyone will be fine. Maybe <laughs> sex doesn't protect LGBT people, and that's OK. They just need their own civil rights moment. They'll get their own new law, and everything will be fine. Well, what we learned from history is that has always been the excuse of people who don't want to afford others equal rights, right? Um, again, the Black Civil Rights Movement is a really great example. You pass all these constitutional amendments in Reconstruction times, saying that people are guaranteed the right to vote, they're citizens, full equal protection of the laws. Uh, it turns out no one wants to mind those limits. We keep passing more and more laws, more and more constitutional amendments, and we keep basically ratcheting up the requirements for what people need to meet to be treated with basic dignity. Well, Title VII, uh, poses a similar sort of problem for LGBT folks. Um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, federal courts, in particular with regards to transgender people, construed Title VII's broad remedial protections as not protecting LGBT people, not for any reasons that would be really vocalized today. They were pretty nasty and pretty gross. You can read these opinions from the 70s and 80s from the Ninth Circuit, Eighth Circuit, and Seventh Circuit, which are not particularly bad circuits to be in, but they were pretty bigoted at the time. 
Um, they basically said that if those sorts of people were going to have protections, Congress would have to pass special laws. Not because the text of these laws didn't protect these people, but because they just wanted to ratchet up the requirements on it. Well, it turns out over time, once we've evolved a little bit, and with some of these other cases, uh, set the groundwork for what LGBT civil rights demands look like. Uh, inferior federal courts, lots of district courts, a good number of circuit courts at this point, sort of had their come to Jesus moment. They recognized the pattern. Hey, this looks like the same thing that we did in the past to all these other minority groups. Maybe we should stop doing that because it's pretty gross, right? Um, so that's basically what's in front of the Supreme Court right now. Um, we also have at the state and local levels, as well as at the federal levels, um, a push to uh, pass new laws, which I believe New Jersey already has, um, that basically formally amend laws to say that no matter what you do, you can't exclude trans people, you can't exclude LGBT people from broad, medial, non discrimination laws. These are all great things. Um, these are not the first moments in time in which these things have been pushed for. The cases in front of the Supreme Court are not, you know, as my colleague uh, to the right of me already mentioned, even the first LGBT cases. And they're not the first transgender cases either. Actually, the first transgender case in front of the Supreme Court was Farmer v. Brennan, which was decided in 1994. Um, it was a prisoner case that recognized that the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment, most definitely does not allow guards to be deliberately indifferent to a prisoner, in particular in that case, a transgender woman being raped by fellow prisoners. That was actually an amazing case. I just looked it up on my phone before I talked just to make sure I got the uh, votes right. But it was actually... Um, Unanimous save for Justice Thomas. Bless his heart, uh, he concurred the judgment. Um, but the other justices at the time, Souter, Rehnquist, Blackman, Stevens, O'Connor, Scalia, Kennedy, and Ginsburg, all joined together to recognize that that transgender prisoner was protected by the US Constitution against rape. Right? That's a really, really big deal, and that happened in 1994. Um, I think, again, to sort of put a fine point on it, it's really great this year to celebrate Stonewall. It's really great this year to mark some of these other cases that we've heard of before. But I think it's also really important to remember that some of what we're uh, realizing, some of what we're seeing right now, it's not just that we finally reached a moment where there's a turning point. It's not just that these demands are for the first time being made. These demands have been made for a very, very long time by lots of different communities. What we're seeing right now, quite hopefully, is a point at which our nation finally reconciles with its horrific past of how it has treated LGBT folks and other groups of folks more broadly. Maybe or maybe not, that is something that we can do right now under the current administration. My hope is we can. Thank you very much. I think uh, one of the lessons as we transition to Bill's slides um, is that the road to equality doesn't always have this single point of departure, and it's almost never a straight road without detours, challenges, and sometimes U-turns. So on that note, we will now turn to Bill, who's going to take us to a more uh, local New Jersey context on some of these issues. Sixties. I grew up in the sixties, so I'm a uh, person used to being in the streets and yelling. Or something I want to resist. Also, I've been doing this work for over forty years, so I come with a very uh, personal historical perspective on it. And with age comes some liberty to say some things I might not have said when I was a younger lawyer. I'm a lot more. I'm a hot head and a loud mouth. So be prepared. <laughs> um, as Ezra said, you know, we're on an arc here. A lot of people in our community thought, oh, we achieved marriage equality, it's all over. That's just the way, um, and it's not a finale. <coughs> um, and so, um, I, uh, I'll say, look at it from that perspective. So, so, uh, Um, can we do the head one more? 
said the notion of same-sex couples and their children constituting a familial relationship worthy of legal recognition was considered by a significant number of our fellow citizens as socially and morally repugnant and legally absurd. The overwhelming number of our fellow citizens now unequivocally reject this shameful, morally untenable bigotry our laws, both legislatively and through judicial decisions, now recognize and protect the rights of LGBTQ people to equal dignity and treatment under the law. So that's a great statement by the courts, and I applaud them for that. Unfortunately, it's not completely true. Um, and that's some of the things I want to talk about. I also want to mention, before I forget, um, when uh, Ezra was talking about trans people fighting on both sides of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Next time you go over the Pulaski Skyway, trans person, remember them. And also I want to say um, that uh, I was in New York City in 1969. I wasn't at the Stonewall Inn, but I was there. But I'll tell you, I was a white gay man. I wouldn't have thrown a stone because I was too afraid to lose my status. You know, I was in law school to lose everything. Without our trans allies and colleagues, we wouldn't be where we are today. Okay. So, what we now consider routine could become illegal again. Just as, I think as Ezra pointed out, they passed the 13th and 14th Amendment giving uh, African Americans all these rights and then they passed laws taking them all away. That could happen again. So I remember back in the 1990s when we were first doing second parent adoptions. We were finally getting judges to recognize the reality of children's lives. That children were living with two parents of the same gender, one who had a legal relationship with that child and one who did not. And we slowly convinced judges that they should recognize the relationship of the child to the two parents. So we ended up in you know, this very interesting context where these two mothers were both legally the parents of the child, but they had no legal relationship to each other. So that basis on which we have that is on a appellate division decision back in the early 1990s. It's not in any statute. It's not in any court rule. This could be taken away tomorrow. It's time for the legislature to step up and enact laws to protect our families. Then we got this wonderful three levels of legal recognition through our courts and legislature. Think back to 2004. Lisa carried us back to 1969, I'm going to flash forward to 2004. George W. Bush is running for re-election. He started the Iraq war and he's scared to death because he knows the public is against him. So what does he do to drive people to the polls? He proposes a constitutional amendment to prohibit same-sex marriage. 2004 is also the same year that a brave Supreme Court, uh, uh, the highest court in Massachusetts, um, in a very bold stroke, said same-sex couples could be married. So we have, on one hand, the President of the United States wanting to prohibit it under the U.S. Constitution, on the other hand, Massachusetts saying they should be allowed to marry. The New Jersey legislators were running scared. They knew they had to do something to protect LGBT couples but God forbid they should give us marriage. So they passed this puny law called domestic partnership, which gave us a very limited number of rights. The most important of which was to exempt us from New Jersey inheritance tax, because that was the most discriminatory part 
of New Jersey law for same-sex couples. If you are in a same-sex relationship and your partner died, you paid a 15% inheritance tax on everything you inherited from your partner. Whereas if you were married, you paid zero. So they amended the law to allow domestic partners to be exempt. Didn't give us a lot, but it gave us something. Then, in Lewis v. Harris in 2006, the Supreme Court said, no, we're entitled to equal rights under marriage. But four of the justices, those four who were subject to reconfirmation, said, oh, well, let's leave it to the legislature to decide what to call it. The three and the minority said, words matter. To say you're married is important. The legislature got this hot potato. They acted just like they did in 2004. They tried to get rid of it as soon as possible, and they came up with this contract called civil union. Yes, same-sex couples could have equal rights, but they couldn't call themselves married. So we entered into civil partnerships, which is a joke. You tell somebody, oh, this is my civil partner, and they say, oh, what kind of business are you in? You know, it sounded like a business arrangement. Those rights had no meaning once you crossed the Hudson River or the Delaware River. So we had a couple, of, you know, one man who was uh, struck by a taxi cab, in New York City, taken to Bellevue Hospital, uh, where he was going to need brain surgery. His civil union partner came to the hospital, and they said, civil union, what's that? We don't recognize that. We don't, you have no rights. So, we had, again, relying on one brave just judge, Mary Jacobson, sitting here in Trenton, who in 2013 said, yes, same-sex couples should be allowed to marry. That decision, the governor first tried to appeal it and was smacked down by the Supreme Court to get a stay, but that is the slender thread on which our right to marry rests in New Jersey. A trial judge decision, a very trial judge decision, but it's only a trial judge's decision. That could be overturned, has no presidential value, really. Could be overturned. Another trial judge could find differently. An appellate division could find differently. The Supreme Court could find differently. I know this sounds outrageous, but think of the time we're living in, where things are happening that we never thought could happen in our country. Again, the legislature has to step up and enact laws that say we have these rights and not rely on Mary Jacobson, as brave as she might be. Now you can say, well, we have Obergefell, where the Supreme Court said that that is a nationwide right to marry in a 5-4 decision. Everything is slender threaded of one judge. And just last month, Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, called in a concurring opinion saying it's time to overrule Obergefell. Now that seems absurd, but he's putting it out in the atmosphere, and these things gain weight, as we're seeing in this terrible, terrible political time that we're living in. So we really have to fight. Um. It's interesting, civil unions are still only open to uh, same-sex couples, not to uh, different-sex couples. So we have three levels of potential uh, legal recognition in New Jersey. We still have domestic partnership, the puny law, um, but now it's been restricted. It's open to both same-sex and different-sex couples, but um, you have to both be over the age of 62. And interesting, you have to live in the same residence. Not sure why that is, because you don't have to live in the same residence to get married or be in a civil union. Then we also have civil unions. And we have marriage. All three are open for same-sex couples, and in my practice, I use all three of them still. There are different reasons to do all of them. Now I'm going to switch to a little more different issue of family law, about parentage and multi-parent multi families. So back in the year 2000, Again, a very brave justice, Virginia Long, came up with the concept of psychological parentage. This concept allows children to continue a relationship with an adult 
not biologically related to them, with, with whom they have developed a parent-like relationship. And that was a great step forward, because let me tell you, there are, there's an acronym in our practice, in my father's practice, called Lesbians Behaving Badly, or Evil Biomont. I'm sorry, I don't want to pick on you lesbians, but let me tell you, there are cases after cases in which I have been involved in where a biological mother has said, oh, this other woman living with me, she's not really a parent. Oh, yes, she cut the umbilical cord. Oh, yes, we sent out an announcement saying on the birth of our child, but now I hate her and she should have no rights to see my child. So that's where the, the case, that's where the concept of psychological parent came up, to protect those people. And that was great 20 years ago. But it's like what uh, Justice Ginsburg said about um, civil unions. It's, you know, skin milk marriage or marriage life. This is parentage life. It still does not protect the child. They're not really a full parent. So if they left money, they died and they left money to their child as a psychological parent, that child would pay a 15% inheritance tax. If the psychological parent became ill, the child is, cannot collect social security benefits as they could if it was a legal parent. And I, you know, we all know couples, or, I mean children who are living with more than two parental figures in their lives, whether it's through a blended family, where there's been divorce and step-parents, uh, it's time for us to really reanalyze all of this. And many states already recognize that you can have more than two uh, parents. Some by statute, California, Maine, uh, Delaware, District of Columbia, and others by case law. Um, and there are many, I see this in my practice, many multiple parent families. Right here in Trenton, I represent two gay men who have had two children with a lesbian couple. The men gave up their parental rights in court, at the courthouse right over here, so that the non bio mom could have complete legal rights to the child. But they act they live like four doors away from each other. They act like a family, yet the men have no rights under our law. There are all sorts of other ways that people create families this day. Okay. Um, Co-parenting. Those are non-romantic people who've decided they want to raise a child together. And that's going on. Yeah. Um, so you could say, well, um, should um, benefits really be tied to marriage and other forms of relationship? Maybe one, one of the reasons a lot of people get married is so they can get the benefits of marriage. And maybe it's time to unlink those. I mean, there are other types of family units. There are other types of units that are financially independent, uh, like uh, two sisters living together, or a polyamorous family. A lot more polyamorous uh, relationships are going on, and I'm confronting them, trying to figure out ways to protect people living in a polyamorous situation. There's a very interesting case that came out of Columbia, South America, just two months ago. Three men were living together as a unit for more than 10 years. One of them died. The two surviving men applied to the government for his pension. They were awarded it. They said, you were an interdependent financial unit, and the two surviving men got recognition by the court of their relationship. At the same time, I don't want to play into what our opponents are doing in um, parts of the, in this country which are very hostile to uh, same-sex marriage. They're deciding, okay, you can have the right to marry, but you can't have any benefits from it. They're separating the right to marry from the benefits. There is a case in Texas where uh, Houston was awarding the same benefits to same-sex couples as to different-sex couples. It went to the Texas Supreme Court, it was challenged, and it went to the Texas Supreme Court that said, Obergefell says you can get married, it doesn't say there has to be equality for the rights of marriage. Mm -hmm. So that could happen to us as well. This is a, a, a changing landscape that we have to be vigilant and protect our rights. Thank you very much. Um, of follow-up questions to start. I think one is one is just a 
context comment, though, because I think, you know, <coughs> in our work here, we are not engaged in, in partisan discussions. But I think that when you put the historical picture that's been painted um, through today's session together, it's important to understand the relevance of the social, political, and cultural climate to any discussion about civil rights and equality under the law for context. So one of the things that I wanted to, um, to pick up on is actually something from the end, so maybe we can work backwards a little. Um, Bill, when you were talking about like psychological parenting, and I open this up for any of, of the panelists to comment on, um, we see advances such as that as benefiting the two adults in the scenario, right? And that's where we can most measurably recognize the gain, if you will. But as you noted, the child does not get the same child benefit, if you will, right? So you said about if they inherit, et cetera. Could you just talk a little bit more about how we need to think more about the children, if you will, in these family scenarios? That's what I try to express to judges every time I'm in the courtroom. Recognize the reality of this child's life and stop trying to put them in a box that some legislature has created. Be a little more creative. There was a case in New Jersey where these two men, a couple, with a, a female friend, were raising a child. Everything went very friendly. They were doing all this press about how well the three of them were raising the child. And then the woman fell in love with someone, a man, and wanted to move to California and brought a case to relocate the child from New Jersey to California. And the two men objected. Well, the judge found that uh, they were a family and that the woman did not have the right to move this child to California, but she only recognized the rights of one of the men, the bio dad. His spouse had no right. I mean, this is a multi-parent family. What are we talking about here? Let, it's time for our laws to catch up to the reality of our lives. I, I think that that's one of the places where some of the litigation impact efforts play a role, right? In having society understand that there aren't just these binary boxes and these kind of double pairings. So, Ezra, I don't know if, if you want to talk a little bit about the ways in which impact litigation isn't just about the message before the court, but it's about shaping the public discourse and understanding? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think sort of that, that's a dimension of impact litigation. So a lot of it is what you do in the courts. It's really awesome if you get a great decision from a judge that, you know, marks, you know, what a great movement this will be for civil rights and this will go into the pages of history. I tend to do cases in red states, so my opinions that are good opinions do not look like that. They look like my client wins. They cite some laws. They cite Justice Scalia just to make sure everyone's kosher with it. It's good. And that's sort of that. A lot of what uh, is good about impact litigation, a lot of the impact that it does make is it sort of starts a public discussion. It gets people to ask questions like Bill's asking, like, why is it that legislatures are making these odd boxes that don't seem to match anyone's look? Right? So it's not just queer people who have different kinds of alternative family formations. It's a lot of families of color, to be frank. It's a lot of poor working class families who creatively come up with different kinds of family units to take care of kids. Um, people who have aunties that aren't blood related, because those are the folks who take care of them. People who are raised by grandparents. Um, people who have all sorts of interesting, complicated, and beautiful relationships, right? So some of what impact litigation uh, does and aims to do is to help educate people in the community to start asking questions, not just about the particular case before them, but about all sorts of things, right? So um, I like talking about, um, I did a jury trial in Oklahoma City a couple years ago, Title Seven one, for a Native American transgender woman. Um, a lot of the discussion with the jury and a lot of the press around that case was frankly to help educate um, the, the public, the community, Oklahoma's a small place, it was basically the whole state, um, about sort of what it is that transgender people, and in particular women just generally, are asking for uh, to be treated equally in the workplace. Uh, my client uh, was denied tenure at a teaching university in rural Oklahoma, right? Um, so a lot of it was to frankly talk about things that we've been talking about for decades. You know, what does it mean to not face sex discrimination in work, not just as a trans person, but as a woman? How many nasty comments can you get about the length of your skirt before that maybe, you know, proves discrimination happened? Things like that. Also talking about sort of more broadly uh, in the Oklahoma context, like why is the state of Oklahoma spending millions of dollars to defend a case that everyone 
present knows they should lose because everyone agrees they did exactly what they're accused of having done. That was pretty interesting. Um, and it's part of sort of, I think, the, the promise of impact litigation. We can open up broader conversations, not just about the particular uh, battle in front of us, but about all of these other things that we're doing. How do we order our society? How much do we believe the people in the state capital are really doing the people's business? And do we really want to you know, stay in the past, even in places like Oklahoma? And you know, putting a punchline on that, we won. Uh, we got a jury verdict of $1.165 million, which is actually one of the largest ever jury verdicts in the state of Oklahoma for a single plaintiff, regardless of case. Right? So that opened up conversations in lots of different ways. And I've been lecturing a lot about employment discrimination law in Oklahoma generally since that, because it opened a lot of doors to a lot of things, way beyond just what the media, media battle looked like at the time. Ariel, in the, in the cases that you gave um, an overview of, one of the things that struck me was the references both to benefits and responsibilities. And I, I wanted to put on the table why the importance of awarding responsibilities as well as benefits? Because I think often in popular perception, we think about advances in civil rights as, oh, X group gained X set of benefits. But there's something, too, about having the responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I think that's, that's a very important, if, and I would assume that uh, Justice Kennedy understood the importance of of explicitly mentioning the two sides of those coins when it came to all the rights that were incrementally recognized in the four Supreme Court cases, to, to put a point on the fact that there were, it's not special rights that gays and lesbians and bisexuals and same-sex couples were seeking um, in bringing this litigation, which was a common um, retort uh, from the opponents. Um, it was simply the ability to have the same, the same life it, and it, as heterosexual couples um, or you know uh, different sex couples. Um, it's interesting. I've heard uh, other speakers talk about wanting to have the same right to have failed relationships as <laughs> different sex couples, and and that really is is I think an important reality. When we're talking about lived reality of of the people who were not only the, the plaintiffs in these cases, but the broader communities that they, they represented. Um, but it was really important, I think, and, and crucial that the court recognized that because I think that quashes, or at least is a good, readily available presidential response to those who would still say that um, the LGBT community is reaching for something that other people don't have. Um, these rights are, are rights going back to um, Romer v. Evans, rights that people didn't, didn't know that they had easy access to, you know, um, going to the courts and claiming, uh, making claims of discrimination on the basis of all the different protective characteristics, because many people did not need to avail themselves of governmental assistance to protect themselves against it. And all uh, that these groups were seeking was the ability to to go to the court as anybody else would um, without this special disability, which is what the court said was being imposed upon them in, in uh, Romer. Thank you very much. I want to make sure that um, there's plenty we could continue to talk about, but that we give time to answer any questions or reply to comments from those who are in attendance. Yes. Well, Ezra, I have a question for you. Who, who funds that? That is a very good question. Um, <laughs> creatively, um, if you co-litigate with the federal government, at least under the Obama administration, they would pick up a lot of the tab. So the Oklahoma case started as a co-litigation with the Department of Justice. To his credit, and it hurts me and pains me to say it, uh, Jeff Sessions funded that case up through right before trial and settled on the merits. And the university is still under a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice right now. So interesting outlets in interesting places. Um, I paid for the trial. Um, generally, um, people who have small firms, so it's just me, I co-litigate with a lot of other people. Sometimes I split costs. Um, if I nail a really big whale, I put all of that money into a fund, and then I fund cases. It's actually, if you do it right, quite profitable. Another question? Yes. I have a question about the Title VII cases that are before the Supreme Court. Can you 
you know any more information about this case? Because I just would be interested to know what exactly they're about and what they're about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are three Title VII cases. Uh, two we call sexual orientation case, cases and one transgender case. Um, they all share somewhat similar questions. It's basically whether because of sex, which is the statutory language of Title VII, protects LGBT people generally, so in very specific factual ways and odd sort of procedural postures. Um, from sex discrimination in employment. Another way to think about it is, and this is just a perennial question in the United States, what is sex discrimination, right? So just like with any other civil rights issue, um, courts find interesting ways to narrow rights when there are groups of people they don't want to protect, right? So for a long time, for instance, uh, my mentor, Kimberly Crenshaw, worked on a series of Title VII cases in her scholarship where black women were basically deemed unprotectable under Title VII despite being protected by race protections as well as sex protections. But for some reason, court, courts found ways to read them out of protection, right? Uh, women generally as a group up until 1989 were sort of deemed as not being protected by sex discrimination laws if they experience sex discrimination called sex stereotypes discrimination. So it's not just that they were told that you can't have the job or you can't have the promotion because you're female, it's because you weren't the right kind of woman. Uh, men have also experienced similar things. They weren't manly enough, even for jobs where being manly like makes no sense. Like there's a case involving a dentist. Like what does it mean to be a manly enough dentist? I have no idea if it does sound like sex discrimination. <laughs> Um, so it's the basic question. It's a question that we've received again and again and again. To be quite honest, um, there's no real issue with this. So it's interesting, the trans case in particular went up. There is no circuit split as to trans protections. No circuit court currently believes trans people are not protected by Title VII, including very, very conservative judges throughout the country. Um, for a while, there were some bad cases in the 70s and 80s, but they all sort of turned face in the 90s and early 2000s. So um, very, very conservative judges have actually gone out and the have actually spearheaded the shift in the 2000s, which is really interesting. There is a odd circuit split if you squint at it in weird ways for sexual orientation, but not the sort of circuit split that would normally shoot something up to the Supreme Court like this. Um, sort of like Bill was saying, this is something we see sort of as part of the political moment we're in right now. It has something to do with the backlash to marriage equality, something to do with just like the storm that we're in, you can fill in the blank of what sort of storm we're in, that the reason why it's up in front of the court is that. Um, and that's that's pretty much what's going to go on. Um, there are some weird procedural problems with a few of those three vehicles, so it's possible that they might be booted back. It's possible that we might get a certain provident granted because the court just doesn't want to deal with it. It's possible they might skip it to the next term, much like they sort of did with marriage equality. We didn't get into like the hot potato situation of marriage equality for a while at the Supreme Court, but um, the court took a bunch of cases and then sort of looked at it and then went like, uh oh, we don't want to do this right now. Uh oh, let's have a narrow decision and let's keep booting it. That might happen. So on that note, we're going to begin to wrap up, and I want to say that I hope that you found today's presentation helpful in understanding both, with, with more understanding, the diversity of the people who come before our courts, as well as the complexity of the issues based on people's material lives, but also to increase our own understanding of the discourse around these issues that happen outside these walls in the public sphere. Um, in activist advocacy and, and political circles. So on that note, we will conclude and thank you all for attending. Thank you.